was. I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know what I would do next. And I met Pastor Lee and Denise in that moment. And the Healing of the Heart Retreat helped me to free my heart, to free my mind, to free myself from judgments that I made, traumas that I had been through that were holding me back, even in that moment that were holding me back. And I was set free, healed, and delivered. And what often takes years, if it ever happens, I was able to take care of in a weekend. And it gave me the foundational building blocks to walk in my true identity, who God called me to be. And I'm here to tell you that three years ago, I didn't know who I was or where I was going, but now, in less than three years, I'm sitting in a state-of-the-art facility. God has, has called me to pastor. People are benefiting, and I'm telling you, what I experienced in healing the heart not only restored my life, but it restored my wife. And the overflow of that restoration is, is flourishing in a congregation. It is changing lives simply because I took the step to get my heart healed. I'm inviting you to do the same. Many of us have experienced traumas and losses, and we've made judgments and have beliefs about beliefs about ourselves that we don't understand why we are, are, are trapped in this box or stuck in this glass ceiling or finding ourselves walking around in cycle. I'm here to cycle. I'm here to tell you it's likely because there are some traumas, there's some things in your past that you need to be healed from. And as a pastor, and, and as even as a, a church leader, I've seen pastors, we've, we attempt to teach it out. We, we attempt to do things to, to, to preach it out. But the fact of the matter is it takes a specific anointing to be healed from your past trauma. And so I just share with you on today, I invite you today, you want to be a part of the Healing Heart Intensive right here in Richmond, Virginia, led by Pastor Lee and Denise Balls. We'll be hosting it. I'll be here with you. But I want to invite you personally because it changed my life, and I am sure it will change you. We send all of our leaders there. And I have yet to have someone go and have the healing of the heart experience and not come back with a life change. So I am just overwhelmed with excitement that here in Richmond, Virginia, you will get to experience what I experienced for myself. What thousands of others have experienced in Hidden Night, North Carolina, now in Richmond, in February 17th and 18th, you will get the opportunity to experience it for yourself. God wants you to be healed. He wants you to be whole. He wants you to walk in your identity. And I will tell you, this will be the best investment you've ever made to getting to that place of being healed, whole, and walking in your identity. So I encourage you, sign up, register below for the Healing of the Heart Intensive here at No Limit Global in Richmond, Virginia, February 17th and 18th of 2023. I look forward to seeing you here. It will be the best investment you've ever made. That I will promise. Bless you. Hello, hello, family. Happy Discipleship Wednesdays. I am Pastor Chris with my good friend, as always, Pastor Tommy. And uh, man, we're just excited about today. So glad you guys could join us. Uh, give us the high five in the chat. Throw your hands up. Uh, share it with somebody. Uh, Discipleship You is what we do on Wednesday nights. And this is an opportunity for us to go deeper into the word. And it's meant for it to be an active conversation uh, where you're activated so that you can uh, ask questions, make comments. And we see them uh, and we try to respond in real time whenever possible. So I'm going to start with our No Limit Charge. Uh, then we're going to pray and then we're going to uh, jump into Discipleship You. Uh, there's no limit to how far God will come to rescue you. And there's no limit to how far he will come to redeem you and to restore you. We have all placed limits on God and no limit global exists to help you discover how you have limited God. So we can help you take those limits off because we truly believe and we are living a life without limits. Now, Father, I thank you uh, for every person under the sound of my voice, whether watching live or watching later. Lord, I thank you that you are healing, setting free, delivering. Uh, prospering, all that are connected to no limit and everyone that's connected to them. Father, I thank you that they are a remnant uh, sent into the earth to release revelation, to release revival and reformation into this world that we would make heaven, we, that we would make earth like heaven. So Father, I thank you that you've called us to do so and we are doing so even right now, that you're meeting every need, that you're exceeding uh, all the desires of our heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You know, <clears throat> I'm struck by the fact that our charge, which is amazing, 
has so much of a focus on redemption and restoration. Amen. You know, um, and it reminds me of when you think about the armor of God, a fair amount of it is defensive. In fact, there's only one offensive weapon or apparatus, and it's the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Um, That tells me that all of us need redemption. All of us need a form of restoration. Absolutely. All of us need to put a part of putting on the armor of God or putting on Christ, a significant portion of it is defensive, protecting what he has given us. And then I don't know that we think about the word as offensively as we should, yeah. as being the thing that we use. That's good. This is not part of our discussion, but it's yeah, yeah it's fascinating is. that, you know, when we say you should read your Bible, we're not saying, hey, breathe air and drink water, it's good for you. We're saying if you want to, if, you, if you're playing defense, you're not giving up ground. Yeah. If you're playing offense, you're gaining ground. That's right. Mm. Is that right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. Two calls for man, Adam, be fruitful and multiply, have dominion over the earth and subdue it. Okay? Say, go take this garden and stretch it as far as you can. New Testament call. Your kingdom come, your will be done on on earth earth as it is in heaven. Said another way, Lord, I want your heaven to invade this earth. Now, many of us say, I'll see Jesus one day. It's great. I mean, I'll go to heaven. But that one call is a here now call. That's right. And so I want to really encourage you uh, here at No Limit. We're about breakthrough. We're about transformation. We're going to talk about that today. We're going to review um, the message from a couple of weeks ago. Um, But when we say we encourage you to, to read your Bible, we're not saying get it inside of you for no reason, because that is the mean we gain ground That's right. by projecting and living out and speaking and decreeing the word of God. Yeah, yeah. It, it's um, the point you make is, is so significant um, <clears throat> because we're, we, you know, I preached a message last year on the Joshua generation. We, we've got land to take. We've got territory to take. We've got, we are the repossessors of heaven and earth. And in order to do so, that means we have got to go do what he, what he gives us to do in Genesis, which is take dominion, go subdue. And, and oftentimes we find ourselves fighting in the natural when in fact what we should be doing is fighting in the spirit realm through the word of God. And so um, whether it be the, the word mm-hmm. in scripture or the rhema, which is spoken to us, whatever the word is, that's how we take that ground. And, um, you know, I would even go as far as to say, if you found yourself knowing that God has called you to take ground, it could be that there's a lack of word in you or a lack of response of, to the word that's been spoken to you. That, that, that is the reason why the ground's not being taken. Yeah. And as we'll discuss, uh, we're going to talk about keys to the kingdom. We're going to talk about revelation and what we will again talk about uh, explosive dunamis grace here. Yeah. But look, the, that, that explosive grace removes an obstacle for what reason? So you can take the ground. For So you can take some ground. That's right. And it That's looks right. immovable. Yeah. Jesus didn't say with the faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move a pebble. That's right. It's a mountain. Some of these things look so mm. immense mm. that you can't see around it, right? But yet you would move a mountain for the sake of doing something. Yeah. You're not bored, Yeah. you know? Yeah. And to, to be clear, I don't care what you think about your life. It, you, you, if you're here, you're meant to do something big. That's right. There's a mountain for you to, be, to move. And that mountain's going to be moved, not by you playing defense, mm. but by going on offense. Uh, mm. I, you know, as I quote my man, Vic, all gas, no brakes. That's right. That's a real thing. That's a real thing because there are mountains <clears> that have to be moved. And how do you move them? You move them through scripture. You move them through God's spoken word to you or through this yeah. ministry. And, and you know, we don't want to necessarily devolve into sports analogies, but the offense defense component is military. And we often play games that have that. And there is a way to take defense and be aggressive with it. Many, especially in American football, it can be extremely aggressive. Absolutely. You know, and some of the best teams that have ever played that sport 
often have some of the best, best defenses. most mm. aggressive, what some would even say offensive defenses. Yeah. You know, so um, this, and, and you know, I'm going to uh, just kind of transition into one of the first points I wanted to make. Last, it, 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 two, you know, two Sundays ago, um, you said something that I just want to recall. If God has drawn you here, it's because God has a specific plan for you. What's at No Limit Global is rare. If you're here, God thinks enough of you that he wants you to be part of this movement. God is not throwing his presence around. He must entrust his presence. Yeah. So this whole point is when, when we read the decree, similarly to when you uh, read the word of God, uh, you know, saints, sometimes we get in this habit of I'll read five chapters a day. I remember uh, uh, Kenneth Hagin, you know, really the word of faith, the father of the word of faith said, yeah. when I read a scripture, if I don't understand it, I don't leave from that. Mm. And I think about my own journey of reading scripture. I used to, when I first read, I literally tried to read five chapters a day and it was, it was amazing. The more I matured, the more I might spend months on one or two verses. Yeah. Attempting to truly get revelation right. from it. Or I might find like, we're going to do it here today. Often when you're in the gospels, you need to find the place where the, where that one passage is in multiple gospels. Amen. Amen. So when you say if you're drawn here, it's because of a specific plan for you. When you said that, what, what was on your heart? What's your intent, you know, for folks? Well, what I believe is that God is, 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 is gathering together a people mm. Um, mm. to achieve something. And so, you know, different churches have different things. I mean, I, I just believe we're a church that's, um, that's offense, uh, that's, that, that's meant for offense. It's meant to take a lot of ground. And so if God has called you here, because one of the things I want to start with is that you don't just choose a church based on, you know, how you feel. It's church is not window shopping. It's not going to the mall and mm. picking the thing that, that you think looks like it's a good fit. Mm. Uh, contrary to many beliefs, it's not a matter of looking and saying, I see what's on this man, man of God, and I want this. So let me just go here. You join a church because God planted you in a place. He's called you to a place. And so that church is there to equip you to do the thing that he's called you to do, to be a part of that body, to get that done. And so I believe that that everybody, every single individual that's been called to be a part of this ministry is called to take a territory, uh, to take control, uh, to, to, to win some ground for the kingdom, whether it be uh, in your family life, whether it be in your work life, whether it be um, in a pulpit, whatever, whatever it is, mm -hmm. you've been called to do that. So I, I just I, I want to always stretch the mind so that you, you have the capacity to realize that God is, is, has brought you here, not just to say you go to church and you experience God when you come here. He's brought, brought you here to walk in an anointing that shifts and changes the atmosphere and the environment that you live in. And, and you know, you mentioned and I, I consider that that joining a church as being part of uh, a key point that you made uh, last uh, the two services ago, which is trust the plan through surrender and obedience. I'm quoting you. Uh, you said the walls of containment are coming down. Trust the plan through obedience and surrender. There are divine appointments scheduled for you. Yeah. So saints, really joining a church is a divine appointment. Yeah. It's not casual. And I'm not saying it has to feel uh, tremendously important when you're doing it. But many of us, I remember when I was joining uh, City Church, which was Mountain of Blessing at the time, I felt called, but I checked with my spiritual mother. I asked mm -hmm. her, here's what I hear the Lord saying. Do you have an objection? It's, it's that important that you need to know That's right. right now. Because you're walking into it doesn't mean you know all that the Lord's going to do. In fact, to be quite honest, often the Lord will keep things from you because otherwise you'll blow it. That's right. Yeah. You get the revelation you need. Go sit in a seat. Go join a, a helps ministry. Go do this. But then the divine appointments, the, the meaning and the steps start coming out. So, you know, and, and when you said divine appointments, you said for impartation and acceleration. Mm -hmm. Now, let me, there's more that you said, but I just want to pause there for a second. Share a bit about what you were thinking and what was on your heart when you were sharing that. Yeah, there are, <clears throat> there are some things that are, that, that, 
that are imparted to you that are that are that are basically you're you're meant to take part of that that are put inside of your life in these divine appointments mm -hmm. and and those things I believe cause great acceleration because mm -hmm. there's ways to get to there, there's ways to get places right you can learn certain things you can um, grow and develop but when impartation happens it brings you to a place um, so in, mm -hmm. some God can impart a gift somebody can impart an anointing on you if if God's called that to be the case and when that happens it's it's as if um, it's as if they take you from one place mm. and move you to another place in a moment that it would have taken you years to get to. Mm. And so mm. these divine appointments are meant to do exactly that. Amen. You know, as we're talking about this, I mean, we just yeah, just had a divine appointment uh, where we were go, able to go to a, uh, a very small um, meeting with Benny Hinn. You know, it was you know, Amen. You know, 15, 25 people there. And <clears throat> so we got to sit at the feet of Benny Hinn for uh, a couple of hours in here. That's an impartation. So there, there is, there is, there's knowledge, there's wisdom, there's anointing that's transferred in that environment that, you know, maybe you could read all of his books. Maybe you could go watch all of his sermons and, put, and, and get it that way as well. But it was an impartation that happened. <coughs> so I just believe that as God has stepped uh, myself into this, into these impartation, these divine appointments, he's doing the same for you. And that might be, I can tell you in business, there are times where I've met people and there's an impartation in business because mm. you immediately see something and get a revelation that you probably would have never got outside of, of, of those meetings. And those meetings are divine. Uh, Apostle Michael Freeman says this all the time. He's like, uh, more things are caught than taught. That's one of his main things. Mm. That, that's very true. Mm. It, we, we in the American society, we in today, we believe that learning is the key. Learning is the key. And I don't want to devalue learning, but man was built to disearn, mm. discern, not learn. There were things that are downloaded into you immediately because in the spirit realm, the spirit knows all things. Mm. So are downloaded into you immediately and we're meant to function that way. So there are some things in these mm. impartations. It's, it's a supernatural download that would have taken you years that you can just receive something in a moment and all of a sudden begin to walk in it. Mm. Now you will mm -hmm. have to learn how to walk in the mm -hmm. thing that you've received, mm -hmm. but your ability to receive it came from an impartation or a supernatural mm. download. You, you know, what's so powerful about that is, <clears throat> you know, fallen man, right? Yeah. Uh, after the fall of Adam and Eve, we, 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 we note inevitably develop some compensating habits. And one is, I'm just going to grind this out of the ground. Yeah. Well, where the earth was working for Adam and Eve, the, the, in the garden, the earth worked for them. Mm -hmm. And God said, look, y'all go out there, it's going to be, it's going to be tough. I'm going to I'm a board up, you know, I'm going to block this <laughs> garden thing and I'm going to, cause you're going to want to go back. That's right. But you can't. Right. And impartation in this dispensation of grace is about receiving something. And in many instances, it has nothing to do with you deserving it. That's right. Nothing. You don't need to have put in the time to get the revelation, the insight, or God, you might have had several divine appointments that God unites together in a fresh revelation, many experiences through one, yeah. right? Like, you know, I imagine uh, the experience with uh, Benny Hinn, you'll probably be feeding on that for years. Absolutely. You know, because you, you know, what he's seen in ministry, just being able to have a, 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 a closed door, small session where you can have question and answer. Usually, you know, we've seen him on TV and there's thousands. Yeah. There's no opportunity for, excuse me, I've got <laughs> yeah. a question. Yeah. You know, or for him to elaborate on something, you know. So um, I, I would even like to, mm. to, to jump in on the fact of mm. when I think about <clears throat> and, I, and I look back and I was having a conversation with a, with a, a pastor friend and we were talking about you know, David's and Saul's. And one of the things I began to realize in that moment because we were, you know, is that so much was imparted to me from my brother. Mm. He didn't teach me in the way it, it wasn't his teachings that did it. It was impartation. It was yeah. the ability to sit at his feet and watch how he functioned, watch how he made decisions to see mm. the why behind the what that was impartation. I had years of impartation that I didn't realize that's what it was. And mm. this goes back to even how people look at ministry today. Many folks are drawn to the teaching ministry and we need it. But really what a lot of us need is impartation. We need the spirit of God to be available and imparting yeah. things into us, then be taught how to do the thing that's been imparted. Yeah. And what we've settled for is 
teach me so I can mentally ascend to try to accomplish something that may or may not have been imparted yet. Mm. And I, I realized that now looking back, that those years of impartation are, were the greatest preparation that I could ever could have learned. I couldn't have ever sat mm. in a classroom and learned what I learned sitting at his feet. I could have never sat in all of his sermons and mm. got what I got from him because I walked with him since a, mm. I was a small child watching how he functioned. And if I just talk in a ministry sense, that I saw how he made decisions. I saw how he walked in integrity. I saw how he poured over the word and did what it called him, what he was mm. called to do. I saw the interactions with him and other pa- There was so much impartation that mm. I look now and I stand and, 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 and here's the thing, what he imparted to me had already been imparted to him. So I received an impartation to him that from a legacy standpoint, he got from uh, Apostle Mike, that he got from uh, um, um, so many people, Ron Carpenter, that he got from Dr. Price, that he got from um, uh, uh, Bishop Robertson. The, the, so I, 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 I got these things from an impartation that I would have mm. never had the opportunity to sit at their feet. But, but, mm. but when you get in, when someone's imparting from you from a person standpoint, you are getting a, 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 a lineage that's coming down mm. and in a moment. And you may not realize it, much like the Benny Hinn meeting. I had an expectation, and we've all seen it. You know, I, I, I thought be a meeting. Ben, yeah, I thought Benny Hinn was going to come in, yeah, yeah. and you know, this is your day, Hallelujah! He's going to throw his coat. We were all going to go out in the spirit, and and that's not what happened. But what happened, and the Holy Spirit helped me to understand quickly. You didn't need to see that. What you needed to do was hear how to walk in something. That's right. It was an impartation that, um, you know, that that will forever change my life. So I just say that to say that, you know. When impartation comes, it doesn't always look spectacular. And if you're not careful, you won't you don't even realize that you're being imparted to. Yeah. So, it, you know, it, it's important to realize that impartation comes in a lot of it may come with laying on the hands and you go out in the spirit. But it may come by being in the environment that God calls you to be in long enough to receive the mm. thing he has for you to, be, to get. You know what, saints, uh, you know, we always come into DU with an agenda and, and you know, we'll step through it, but uh, we're going to. I'm going to take everybody here into either my backyard or Pastor Chris's backyard. We're going to have a little discussion here because this is often how the, this this format is started years ago, yeah. right? And uh, I just want to just press into a couple things that you said. One, there are two things that come together, and you use the terms together. I just want to make sure we we pull them together: legacy and impartation. Mm. They go together. Uh, there is a legacy that is uh, uh, like a generational passing down of, and then now the of, you know, it, what we hope is it's, it's, it's godly kingdom uh, uh, attributes, um, uh, identity, purpose, destiny related things. Now, but there is a, multi, a, a, a legacy that can be passed down that is absolutely not that. Yeah. Right. So what what Pastor Chris is sharing and then there's another key point here and then we'll pull them together is. And we know this from parenting. So much of raising somebody, of imparting something on them, of discipling them is not merely. In fact, most of it is not what we say. It's what we do. So which then puts the classroom in context. A classroom has a purpose. Yeah. But the purpose is you, you don't disciple somebody in a classroom. You disciple them in life. Jesus had 12 disciples. You might say, why not 24 or why not 120 or why not? Well, discipleship is intimate. It, there's a close proximity to it. You need access and you're observing and so think about how it is for our kids. Our kids are really being taught mostly by what we do. That's right. Not merely by what we say. And when there is consistency between what we do and what they say, they see the integrity there. Yeah. And if you want to build a child of integrity, be a parent of, of integrity. integrity. That's right. So what you're saying by saying, I'm <clears throat> sitting at my brother's and my pastor's feet watching him. That model, we've seen that play out. Where? Um, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, yep. right? 
Joseph, right? Uh, Moses, Joshua. Yeah. Good. Uh, to some extent, Saul, David, but then David, Solomon. Mm -hmm. This this thing that we're talking about is all throughout the Bible. Yeah. Uh, you know, think about the twelve, well, the eleven apostles, and then. Uh, Saul of Tarsus, who becomes Paul, Paul, comes later, and then think about Philip and Stephen, and th yeah. there's there's discipleship happening constantly. And this point is so important because we're not called to get people saved; we're called to make disciples. Yeah. Where salvation is a component of it, but salvation to say I'm to here to make disciples, salvation is like, hey, make sure that you invite them into the door, open the door for them, and let them come in. Then the work starts. That's right. Amen. Amen. So there's so much that you just pulled together. That I want to say, and look, we all, when you hear us say we have spiritual parents, what we're saying is somebody has graced me by discipling me. Yeah. You, you know, and it can, and it doesn't have to be, I mean, they don't have to be related, but they can be. Yeah. My grandmother is really my first spiritual mother. Mm. She was the one, I sat at her feet, I watched her. She, I watched her read the word, I watched her talk about it. I, to, say, I, to some extent, this conversation here is a conversation I had hundreds if not thousands of times around the coffee table and around the dinner table with my grandmother. Yeah, amen. Amen, amen. so, so this, this and, and, I, and I wanna bring it back to what we're talking about, those are divine appointments the power of God, the revelation of God, God is using humans to model him out. Yeah. I would even throw it, throw it in there. That it, this is something that can easily get missed, especially in modern day times. Yes. The church, I'm not sitting under any man. I'm not this and that. Listen, mm -hmm. God's way is a man. I've even struggled with that as, the, as a leader of saying, hey, you know, everybody can get here and do this. And, and God's like, no, no, no. There are certain things I put on certain people and you will not get it. You will not get it if you don't go through them. That's how it is. Elisha and Elijah. Yeah, it, it, this is, and, and, you know, and it comes back to a dirty word that the church doesn't like to use called submission. To authority, absolutely. To authority. And th the fact of the matter is, this is the way of the kingdom. It doesn't matter if it's been abused. It doesn't matter if it's been misused. It doesn't change the fact that this is how the kingdom functions mm. and how it works. And if you don't understand or, or get revelation that, God assigns you to a shirt to a church really for impartation. More so, and in, 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 uh, this is a whole different thing. But we we, are, we have found ourselves being drawn to get teaching. But what you are assigned to the church for is impartation, and then the teaching comes for you to walk in the impartation that you are intended to receive. Uh, then then you could miss the whole thing because we could get attracted to great teachers who don't who have don't have the assignment the authority or the anointing yeah. to impart that which they are teaching well you know and, and in fact let's just kind of lay it out there right <laughs> um, teaching teaching has a context and teaching has a purpose I, I, I'm gonna suggest what I believe we at no limit believe yeah. um, we don't teach the, or, no, we teach the Bible, but we're not teaching it so that you can get smarter. That's right. And nor are we teaching so that you would be enamored with what we know. Because I'll sh share with you, uh, almost every week we're learning new stuff. So you shouldn't be enamored with what we know because Holy Spirit's just dumping stuff on us and we're <laughs> almost like parroting it back out to you. Um, we're actually teaching you towards the supernatural. That's right. We are teaching you towards deeper and deeper relationship and deeper and deeper encounter with the living God. And, and mm -hmm. as such, moving you towards activation where you can start bringing other people in and through your own efforts, leading them to encounter, leading them into his presence, etc. That's why we teach. So we're not trying to relay knowledge so much as we're attempting to share what God has revealed to us mm -hmm. for the sake of you imparting it on you so that you can move into deeper encounter. When we say explosive grace, when you say his presence, when we say relational, if you don't think the kingdom of God and Christianity is relational, then why in the world did God term himself father? Absolutely.
father is a relational term. To be a father, you need children. That's right. And what Amen. children doesn't speak to his, what father doesn't speak to his children? I mean, yes. Yeah. So if you think God doesn't speak to you, I mean, what father doesn't speak to his children? And if you're thinking, well, I don't hear him. How many of us parents know that we'll speak to our children sometimes and they don't hear us? That's right. They're they're preoccupied. That's right. Right. So, mm. in this concept of divine appointment, let me tell you, your life is filled with them, and I love how you put it. They'll seem insignificant. And oftentimes we will flat out miss it. And when I was sitting around there, I was bored when my grandmother was reading the Bible to me and wanting to talk about it. Yeah. I was bored. But it, the format that we did it, Pastor Chris, is the format you and I do it. Now, she knew a lot more than me, but she'd invite me into it. What do you think it means? Yeah. What do you think it means? And she was starting to exercise spiritual muscles that needed to be exercised. I mean, I'll take you even as far as this ministry. The two of both sets of my pastoral staff, I tried to get out of, I, I, I basically shunned both of those relationships up front. Those were divine appointments. <laughs> they really were. Pastor Tommy and Pastor Camille show up. They're all happy, excited. They want to hang out. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing that. Uh, they need to go hang out with somebody else first. The, the same thing was true for Pastor Mario and Pastor Renee. Mm -hmm. They came in wanting to for, for community and family, and I was like, y'all, yeah, I'm not doing that either. Yeah. And and those were divine appointments that could have easily been missed. And had it been left up to my carnal, not mine, I was trying to miss them. But God's uh, grace and His mercy helped me to identify and take opportunity to take those divine appointments because mm. who could have seen then that that would be what's here now. And those, but, and I'm telling you, those are, I, I did not want to hang out with Tommy and Camille and I did not want to hang out with Mario and Renee. And that was because there were broken things on the inside of me. But God knew that those were divine appointments that were going to make covenant connections that would then help to hold up a ministry that other people would then connect to and build a family from that. That's mm. what I'm talking about, divine appointment. Mm. Um, it, it, and and then the, just the impartation that comes from them. Yeah. Oh, but multi direction. It doesn't matter that you didn't want them. The impartation that has happened across these families Absolutely. is extreme. It is. You know? and, 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 you know, I. I want to loop in. Sometimes you're like, okay, divine appointment, great, I get it. What's the significance of it? Oftentimes, the, our big issue is we're in time. Mm -hmm. So we see things in seconds and minutes and hours and days, right? We often, occasionally we'll see them in years, but decades, it all, things get lost, mm -hmm. right? But I'll give you a, a, a really good biblical example of a divine appointment, one that honestly, the apostle that was involved did not want to do it and then later had to defend. But, but I want to share it with you to share, to share with you the importance and the significance of divine appointments and being obedient to engage in them. And I won't read the scripture because it would take a, a chapter and a half, but it's in Acts 10 and Acts 11. There's a Roman centurion, a person of of, um, of actually uh, authority, um, who, uh, Cornelius, who gets a vision from God, actually gets a visit from an angel that says, hey man, I want you to invite Peter to come to your house. Mm -hmm. Now, if you know, th this is early in, in, <laughs> in the church, and you know, the Jews, they don't go engage at that time, they don't go engage with Gentiles. Yeah. And Cornelius is a Gentile. So on one side of this relational equation, this angel shows up to Cornelius says, send some of your people to this house. That's where Peter is. Well, Peter is there, right? And Peter's in, in prayer and gets caught up in the spirit and the sheet comes down with these unclean animals and the uh, Holy Spirit says, hey, kill and eat. And Peter's like, no, nah, man, I, you know, those animals are unclean. I don't do that. And so uh, later, Peter's like, well, what does this mean? And then Holy Spirit reveals to him as Cornelius's um, servants come, his, the people under his command, to invite Peter to come to the house. And Peter's like, hey, I want you to go with them. This is okay. Gives him the revelation of what it means. So Peter then goes to Cornelius's house, which of course is forbidden right. in Jewish law. And Holy Spirit's like, I want you to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them which also is not happening right now. That is not happening. Mm -hmm. Right now, the church is ministering to the Jews. That's right. Right? So, Peter starts, if you probably know the, the story, 
And as he's sharing about Jesus, Holy Spirit falls in that spot, and these Gentiles, the Romans, start speaking in tongues. Now, fortunately, Peter's got some, he's got some people with him who have come from him, some Jewish folks that are with him ministry-wise that are witnessing this. Peter then says, well, look, if Holy Spirit's fallen on these folks and they're now speaking in tongues, who are we to withhold salvation mm. and baptism? So they do it. Now, a divine appointment, Pastor mm. Chris, Holy Spirit working one side, angels working another, brings them together, right? Yeah. Now, the next chapter, go to 11, Peter has to come report back to Jerusalem and there's some issues here. Because they're like, what you doing? We don't minister to the Gentiles. Peter says, hey, hey, I, first of all, I got some people with me here. They were, here, they, were, they were here with me. Right. And he proceeds to explain how it happened. And the key is this. He says, now, as I was merely sharing with them the story of Jesus, Holy Spirit falls on that spot. They start speaking in tongues. Now, this, this also is a quick lesson. How important is that? So important that Peter and all the other apostles realize if God's going to give them that, who are we to withhold the rest? That's right. Right? Mm -hmm. And I share this with you not because it's a cool Bible story. I share with you to say we are still living out the benefit of that divine appointment. All of us who are not of Jewish heritage benefit from that divine appointment to this day. If you want to know how significant it is, there are 2.2 billion saints, Christians on this planet. There are 14 million Jews. Yeah. So if you think, if you ever wonder, does a divine appointment bear fruit? I would say that divine appointment broke it open and bared fruit and Paul literally walked into that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So actually Peter is the one that started it and then Paul walked, walked it out. out. Paul's the one that ended up evangelizing most of the Gentile spaces. It, it is uh, one of the things I find amazingly significant uh, just because of the way I believe the Lord calls me to see and, and, and mm. how many people in that moment that Peter was in when Holy Spirit fell would have fallen back onto the religious belief system and said, I cannot preach Jesus to you. I cannot, I can't do this because of these rules and regulations. Well, Peter, the dream is it came a couple of times. The sheet drops a couple of times. He, he's like, he's he like, no. ignored. Just so, so, so saints, this is so key. When God is moving you towards a divine appointment, as you engage with him, he's saying, I need you to co-labor with me. Yeah. And it's okay to engage. Mm -hmm. When we first came up, hey, Pastor Chris, look, love's in the air. Hey, let, let's go hang out. You're like, uh, uh, uh no, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. No, right? And I mean, Ananias, well, not Ananias, um, who's the gentleman who was to go lay hands on Saul of Tarsus? I can't think of who it is. I don't think it was Ananias. Yeah, it, Maybe it was. Anyway. It might help us out in chat. Yeah, but yeah. anyway, that, when, when Holy Spirit says, hey, I need you to go lay hands on Saul of Tarsus, he's like, what? You're yeah. crazy. Yeah, Saul's trying to kill us. He's like, I understand that. Thank you. But I need him to get his sight back, and you're the person that needs to go over there and lay hands on him. Revelation is a key mm. to unlocking mm. this dunamis grace. Mm. And, and you could miss Revelation based on leaning on your own understanding yes. of a current situation. Yes. Because the current situation says, you can't do that. Current situation says, we're not about to go lay hands on, on this brother because mm. he's killing us. Mm. But Revelation says, if you will be obedient to the revelation, then I'll open up a whole new thing that, that supersedes and overrides whatever your current situation is. That's God right. always functions by revelation. Revelation is a key, is a key to walking in explosive grace. You know, it is, it is, but I wanna go back, I wanna advance us a little bit in what we we're gonna talk about today and get yeah. to something important, but you mentioned four things that are key for us as we're walking out this discipleship journey. And discipleship, I'll just, it, it's like the disciple is increasingly becoming like Christ in everything. Yes. And he modeled this, by the way. So he modeled it for us, mm -hmm. right? We sit at his feet, he modeled it. Uh, and those four things are obedience. That's right. So revelation's one thing, obedience, 
to the revelation, mm-hmm. to, to the, submitting to the authority and being obedient. Uh, um, surrender, yeah. uh, courage. Peter, he's stepping out. He is stepping yeah. out. He is stepping out knowing that he's gonna have to defend himself. Now, of course, saints, there's uh, uh, the fact that it's Peter does matter here. It, there might have been another apostle that would have been like uh, excommunicated. Yeah. Fortunately, it's Peter. He's got witnesses. And Jesus, and, 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 and God did it, and Jesus did it the way that they did it. If he'd have salvation first, then baptism, then baptism in the Holy Spirit, it probably doesn't work well. God's yeah. sovereign act of having them speak in tongues first mm-hmm. enabled it. And then the, the last is authenticity, I believe. So obedience, surren- oh, vulnerability. So surrender, yeah. vulnerability. So it's obedience, vulnerability is a term you use, um, uh, courage and authenticity. Authenticity is like, I am who God made me to be and I'm going to be who he intends for me to be in any and every circumstance. When you marinate that with revelation and faith, you've got something. Yeah. yeah right? Absolutely. Amen. Yeah, you know, these are the things that we have on, you know, our first church that we had said vulnerability. Mm. Yeah. You, you've got to be vulnerable in, in if you're going to walk in this, uh, mm. in this revelation that we have. Why? Because you don't, you, it's not you who knows, it's God who's showing. And so, in, it, so there's, a, there's, a, there's a place where you, you've got to be authentically you. You've got to be transparent. And in that transparency, you're going to be vulnerable. Yeah. Just what it is. Because there's going to be rejection. Yeah. It's good. There's there's some be- are going to reject you. They might later come back and accept you. I mean, I, I, I'll give a good example. When we first went to Pastor Chris, what he's saying is he essentially rejected us. Now, we didn't know that we were being rejected because he was saying it, you know, uh, with an accent that sounded like, <laughs> oh, well, you know, I'm busy. But he was rejecting us. Yeah. And that happens overtly or not so overtly. And that doesn't mean, though, that we still don't step in, in, in an authentic way. Now, if yeah. you're trying to be, uh, if you're trying to manipulate a situation, that's different. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Now, I want to uh, move us a little bit forward, and I want to talk about a particular set of scriptures that involve uh, two, well, they, they really involve two things, but we had a third in there. One is revelation through relationship, which I love, right? You know, which we just talked about. But we talked about keys to the kingdom, and we also talked about all things are possible for those who believe. I mean, two of my all time favorite scriptures and subjects, period. And the, 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 the stories that are here involve. Jesus saying, who, do, who am I? Who do people say I am? Yeah. Right? To the, to the disciples, a small set. It then, interestingly enough, involves a little bit of a Jesus sharing with the disciples immediately after that. And then, interestingly enough, in three Gospels it shows up, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It then is this, cha- this kid who is demon-possessed. Right, mm-hmm. who the, pa- the the father is begging Jesus, please help us. I, I, I brought the, my child to your disciples, but they couldn't do anything with it. So these are the common threads in all three of these stories that show up in these gospels, right? And 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 in one of them is the keys to the kingdom. In the hey, who do people say I am? Is in all three. The child, the story of the child is in all three and all things are possible is in all three. Yeah. I just want to have a quick, now, now this is a bit more discipleship, you digging in for the sake, but remember this is about offense. This isn't about defense. The word of God is about offense. I want to put some context into what it means for to have these keys yeah. and, and how to actually operate them. Okay. So when you first said keys, and I love that. You, you said, boy, keys imply that there's some doors. That's right. And keys imply that the doors, you can't just go open them. That's right. And in fact, that there might be, along with power and access and kingdom realities behind the doors, there might be some mysteries. Mm-hmm. Amen. Yeah, the, 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 you know, when, when, you know, the way the Lord showed it to me was when you have keys, mm. there's, you only need a key if there's a lock. 
you don't lock something up is because your intention is not everybody gets to go in and nobody, not everybody gets access. Mm. So I lock something up and I give specific people keys that I want access to these kingdom realms that are available. And not only do I not want everybody to have access, just because we're all in the same family doesn't mean we all get the same set of keys. Um, and so behind those doors are the things that you need to fulfill and do the thing that God has called Amen. you to do. Amen. Uh, it, it is, um, I think in the body of Christ, we oftentimes we're like, hey, well, everybody's got keys to do everything. Everybody doesn't have keys to do everything. Everybody couldn't do what Peter did and everybody couldn't do what Paul did. Let's just go right there right now. So yeah. we say, you know, that, that we're, we're a little bit out of order, but there's this key to the kingdom part. This is key for, because we, we, we have access to keys. Jesus says, who do people say I am? Yeah. Now, granted, Peter's pretty close to Jesus, but so are some others. There's That's 12 right. people there. That have been with him for years. Twelve people there that have been with him for years. Watching miracle signs and wonders. Folks are spouting all stuff, not random folks. Part, <laughs> parts of the twelve are spouting stuff off, and up Jesus. I mean, uh, Peter lays out, "You are Jesus the Christ." That's right. And now, first of all, it's astounding that the eleven of them didn't get this, but it's also astounding that in that moment, Peter had that revelatory key mm -hmm. and he put it in, turned it, got the revelation and boom, it came out. Yeah. And through his, through his revelation, yes, he became the revelation for everybody else. Yes. Cause they couldn't see what he saw. That's but right. What if he never says it? Yes. And what if he never walks out in it? And if this feels, you know, so mysterious, you can't understand it. Bible clearly calls out, you cannot say Jesus is Lord without Holy Spirit. That's right. You cannot. You don't know you've sinned that Holy without Spirit. Holy Spirit. Yeah. Right? So this concept is still active today. To be able to say, Jesus is my Lord, Jesus is my Savior, requires Holy Spirit. Absolutely. So that you can be sitting around other people, hear a message, and th this is the lesson. Mm -hmm. And it's not, and look, it's not like the other 11 then went, went home and never did anything. Yeah. Not at all. In fact, except for one, those 11 were in Jerusalem when, when Peter had to come back and give a testament. Mm -hmm. James was there, John was there. They're like, what's up, dog? Yeah. <laughs> and evidently they were, uh, had enough of an authority to be able to ask Peter. The same Peter who said, Jesus, you're the Christ, he needed to answer some, to some people. Yeah. Your, your revelation becomes, you li being a living epistle, it, it, mm becomes the revelation for others. And, and, and Peter could have gotten frustrated. Jesus could have got frustrated. Man, what in the world? We all been walking. We all been seeing the same things. And we, how do y'all not know he's the Christ? What, I mean, what mm, are you stupid? Mm, What's the, mm. This is how many of us as immature believers, mm. this is how we get. God has given us a kingdom key in revelation. He's revealed something to us. Then we're mad that everybody else didn't get it. They didn't get it because they got you. And then because you got it, now when you walk it out, they then will get it because you become that revelation. So you walking out the revelation that God gives you becomes the revelation that other people get to live in and walk mm. through. And, and you know, the, the, there's such a powerful testimony here about co-laboring, about the need for relationship. Oh, yeah. I almost wish this scripture had been more of a trivia thing where each one would have gotten something, but the other's not, you know, yeah. type of thing. Yeah. So we could see it all work out. But, uh, but I, I, I'll give you the, the best personal example that I have other than, I mean, not many things are as significant as the fact that, you know, I have a biological daughter. The doctors literally told us we could not have one, right? But before we even got into the miraculous part, my wife comes to me one day and says, I think we should have a child. Now, I did not have that revelation at all, y'all. I thought we were beyond the time where we should have children. I thought we should do something very different with our life. And Holy Spirit had to work with me to get to where my yeah. wife was. Amen. Right. So my point is the one of the great elements of relationship is that others can get revelatory insight in areas that we don't have yeah, that's right. later. God used my faith to, to put a cap on a situation and, and, and release explosive grace for the enablement because we needed a miracle because the doctors are like, it's impossible, mm -hmm. right? And so I want you to hear this clearly. We need such relational equity that we can allow folks to speak into our life with revelation that they have that we don't. Yeah. And then leveraging their revelation, 
we can bring something to the table. That's right. You know, I mean, there is such a power in relations. It's like a, a strand of fabric versus a, a rope. Yeah. You know, Threefold and, and the, they're, different, they're different roles. Like, you know, we talked about teacher. There's apostle, there's a prophet, there's a pastor, there's an evangelist, there's a teacher. All these roles are necessary. They don't all come from the same perspective, That's right. but knit together, they provide a fa an, a, a, an equipping, an enabling fabric. Mm -hmm. Amen. Now, I do want to move, uh, I do want to also push forward to say now in that context, when Peter said that, Jesus comes and says, hey man, I'm going to tell you some stuff. I'm going to give you these keys. And he says, with these keys, and I'm going to read you a couple things and then let's just talk it through. I'm going to read the Amplified. Whatever you bind, forbid, declare to be improper, unlawful on earth will have already been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose, permit, declare lawful on earth will have already been loosed in heaven. I mean, I'm getting revelation just based on just, just in the moment, of saying, <laughs> you know, because what he's saying is I'm going to reveal something to you. And from this thing I reveal, yes. whatever you decree and declare will automatically already has already been declared before you decree it. Amen. You're releasing it. Yeah. You're just releasing it. So I'm giving you a picture, an image. I'm giving you this, this, I'm, I'm giving you this insight and based upon this insight, everything connected to it is already available. It is now your job to agree with heaven and do it. So whatever, when you get this revelation, whatever you see that needs to be done is, is probably what needs to be done. And it's already been released in heaven. Now Amen. you just need to release it. In you're, you're the portal. That's right. You're, you're the conduit. And so key here, Think about the, the implications of offense, defense. Whatever ain't supposed to be there. When you bind it, it's bound. That's right. We, heaven moves on your command to release, to, to bound, bind the thing that should have been bound. Mm. And whatever oh, you loose, heaven moves to bring to bear. In the absence of the thing that should not have been there, it fills it up with the thing that should be there. It, it, you know, as you were talking, what I saw was like when you call, when, when a coach calls a play on a football game, football team, he's saying, okay, we're going to score a touchdown. Here's the play. Everything that needs to happen for this play to, so let's just say it's a handoff, I'm handing it to the running back. Every assignment that needs to happen so that running back gets the ball to where he needs to get it to is automatically, there's already an open heaven for it. The lineman does this. And so everything is, is already okay, moved and empowered to happen so that the play that's been called can actually happen. So when God gives you revelation, what he's done is he's saying, I'm calling this play. Mm -hmm. It's your job now to give assignments and directions to whatever needs to be ha needs to happen so that this play can take forth, can, can, can come forth. That's right. And that's literally all you have to do. And because you have said it, it's already been said in heaven. And it will come to pass because I'm I'm the one calling the play. Here's the play. Mm -hmm. Now you just go in and say, hey, here's the end result. So I got to be debt free. That play's done. I got to be. Th th this has got to happen. This mountain's got to move. All of those things have already been declared in heaven because God's given me the play to run here. Mm. Now I, I love the fact that you mentioned mountain because sometimes God's like, hey, you got these keys. I'm gonna need this to happen. And when you look. <laughs> yeah. You can't see nothing but a mountain. That's right. You look to the right, there's a mountain. You look to the left, there's a mountain. You look up, there's a mountain. Yeah. And one of the first things you need to do is to command that mountain to move. Mm -hmm. Now, this is where, and, and let me just kind of step into another realm here because uh, the, remember he says you get these keys and we're in this, this story that is in Mark, Matthew, and Luke. Yeah. Now, in each one of these gospels, in this flow of, of verses, Jesus says, if you want to follow me and be my disciples, mm -hmm. I'm gonna need you to, I'm gonna tell you, you're gonna need to do some things. Number one, I want you to deny yourself. Number two, I want you to take up your cross. Both of those, I would assume, are daily, hourly, whatever. And number three, I want you to follow me. Now, 
oftentimes, you know, you'll hear us, you know, you'll see these key thing and you're like, well, how do I get these keys? This scripture is directly proximate mm -hmm. in every one of these gospels. He is saying, if you want to follow me, if you want to be my disciple, if you want to walk it out mm -hmm. like me and everything, if you want to walk under the open heaven and you want to operate these keys, you need to do this. Now, this requires some explanation. The deny word, most of us look and say, man, I'm going to have to not drink, not smoke, not curse, uh, you know, and deny all sorts of pleasures for the sake of following him. And then the cross is all struggling, so now I got to go struggle. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I just want to just provide a little bit of insight. That Greek word deny is the same Greek word that is used when Jesus tells Peter, you are going to deny me. You're going to deny that you know who I am. Mm -hmm. And I just want to let you know you're going to do it. That's good. Now, later, Peter, unfortunately, completely models that out. I don't know who this brother is. Y'all think I'm with him. I don't know him. That's the deny that's used here. To deny oneself says that part of me that is not like him, I don't know who that is. Mm. Insisting I don't know who it is. I might, okay, so you think you knew me before. I don't know that person anymore. That's right. I remember Jesse Duplantis was uh, in a meeting said, a, he, he described her as a, a harlot, a woman on a plane, <laughs> yeah, tried, to, tried to, you know, seduce him. And he said, I'm a dead man. Mm. Ain't nothing here. What he was saying is that part of me that could be seduced has been so denied and so suppressed, brought under subjection, the flesh, mm -hmm. that there ain't nothing here. You're talking to a dead man. That's right. Now. Let's deal with who you are. Yeah. She didn't know. She was in the midst of a divine appointment. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And then he starts screaming who she is out <laughs> on the plane. You know, like, but my point is, and then to pick up the cross, this is being said before the crucifixion. So the, one needs to understand if you're looking at this, the context is people knew what a crucifixion was. Yeah. And what happened is the convicted person who was to be put on the cross, it was, it was conventional for them to carry the implement of their own demise to the location where it then be put in the ground and then they'd be staked to it or tied to it and left to perish. Mm -hmm. So what he's saying is, hey, look, first, that part of you that ain't of me and ain't affiliated with me, I want you to deny it like you don't even know mm -hmm. who it is. Number two, I'm going to tell you, you going to need, there are going to be times where in obedience to me, you are going to have to carry the implement of your own demise. Mm. Sometimes you're going to have to walk into a situation, represent me and know that you will be rejected. Know that you, people will speak about you. Know that they might even <clears throat> harm you. You might lose jobs. You might lose all sorts of stuff. I still need you to do it. I need you to carry the thing that will cause the judgment That's right. into the situation where they will judge you. That's right. Right? And then follow me. And I'm going to tell you, saints, this is in scripture. Obedience, vulnerability, authentic, authenticity, and courage. You could lay these things over here like a glove and they're the same thing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to need you to obey me. I'm going to need you to be vulnerable. I'm going to need you to be who you are in me. That's right. And I'm going to need you to walk that out with courage. Seek me, not them. That's right. I don't, you do that. And I think what Jesus is saying, you want to follow me? You want those keys? You want to move? Here's what you do. And I'm going to show you why. I, why. Now, then Jesus does something that pops it like a cork in a bottle. But before I go to that, let me just pause. There's a lot here. I, I, I grabbed the mic for 10 minutes. You know? No, the, amen. The, the, you know, it is, um, you know, it, as you're talking, it, what comes to mind is Proverbs. Lean not on your under, understanding. Deny yourself. Yeah. D deny yourself. I mean, and, and then you've got to be willing to know that, uh, I don't know what the, the, the scripture is, but um, no man has left houses, cars, lands, mothers, brothers, 
that won't receive a hundredfold in this lifetime. So the revelation is. But there is some leaving. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You go, th there you go. That's the cross part. Yeah. That's the cross part. There's some leaving. Because it's not easy. It's, that's the part that's not easy to do. It wasn't easy for Abraham to leave his father's house and, the, and to stop worshiping the moon. That wasn't an easy. That was a cross to bear. What do you think people were saying to him? Mm. Man, we've been serving the moon God for all this time. Why in the world would you do this? You're going to leave your father? Have you lost your mind? The greatest Abraham thing. He finally gets the son, Isaac, that he wants. Yeah. And God's like, thank you. Oh, I'm so glad you're, you're, you're so blessed. Now go take him up and sacrifice him. Okay. When, through Isaac, he, the, 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 literally the, the name Abraham hinges on Isaac. That's right. Yeah. It, That's what's ooh. called obedience and vulnerability right there. You, he, and look, Isaac's carrying the wood. Yeah. Isaac's carrying the wood. It is a, it's a, it's a, it's a perfect example mm. of, of carrying the cross. It it's, is. It, it, and, 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 and many of us won't pick it up because of what something looks like. When God is calling you to do something, sometimes the fact of the matter is, it says, for those who will leave, houses, will. land. Dude, you, mm. you're going to have to step out of what's known and what seems comfortable yeah. into, and that's, that's what the wilderness represents. Mm. If you're willing to step out of, uh, what you determine is normal, even though what your normal is is slavery. If you're willing to step out of that and you'll leave it, then and I'll give you a hundredfold. Mm. So I was taking mm. you through the wilderness to the promised land. Mm. But even though I took you out of the physical place, you couldn't get out of the mental place. So I couldn't take you to where I needed you to be. Mm. And, and it, it's a it's the same representation. What has God called you to walk away from? What what you know form of religion? What what addiction? What what family situation? What is it that he is saying to you? And what you? Yeah. What, what you, you needs to be denied. That's right. What is it that you might be holding on to that God's like, you know what? That ain't coming with us. That's right. That's right. And, and I'm going to tell you, Peter denied Jesus a bunch of times with the handicap. Yeah. So that word's the same. So we know what it looks like. That's the right. last time he was, boy, uh, if you read scripture and really unpack it, he was insistent to the point of probably being profane. I don't know, blah, 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 right? Yeah. Now, I want to bring this home real quick because we're going to do this. So, so, you know, you're reading these stories in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and Jesus has said everything he says. Then, interestingly enough, comes this man with this son who's got this demon, mm -hmm. throwing him in water, throwing him in fire, brothers convulsing all over, the kids convulsing all over the place, and the father begs Jesus. Can you please help me? And then he says something. I brought him to your disciples, but they, were, they weren't able to deal with it. Mm. My son still got this thing. Jesus then turns to them and says, you know, essentially, what's up? What, what am I going to do with y'all? I ain't going to be here all the time. Calls him a faithless generation, right? Mm. The father's like, Please help me if you will. And Jesus is, and then and Jesus says, all things are possible for them to believe. And then the, Jesus said, and then, then the man cries out, this is key. I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. And, when, and you know, he's, he is a prayer supplication. He's begging. Mm -hmm. He's begging for his son. Then Jesus rebukes the spirit. It flops around in one gospel, one it just comes out. You know, it's, there's a bit of a demonstration, but then this, the demon ultimately leaves. And now the kid's, you know, in his right mind. The disciples then come back to Jesus later and say, hey, man. Okay, what's up? Mm -hmm. How come we weren't able to do it? Because Jesus clearly had the expectation that they, sh they should have been. been able to. Yeah, yeah. Should have been able to based on the discipleship he had shared with them. But remember again, their keys and evidently those keys weren't available to them. Jesus then says, it, the, the, the story is a little bit different. In one gospel, this kind of unclean spirit cannot come out by anything but prayer to the Father. That's in Mark. Mm -hmm. If you have living faith the size of a mustard seed, you will be able to say to this mountain and, you know, move to the side. And then he says, but this kind of demon does not go out except by prayer and fasting is in Matthew. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So let me tell you what Jesus says here, saints. He's like, okay, first of all, who they think I am? Okay, I'm Jesus the Christ, blah, blah, blah. If you want to follow me, you get these keys. To follow me and to really hold these keys is what you need to do. And then he says, let me show you what it's like to have a key to something that clearly other people don't have. Y'all, y'all with me. You're supposed to be following me. They call you my disciples. You're enamored because Peter said I was the Christ, but evidently all of y'all couldn't deal with this one spirit. That's right. But I need you to. I need you to learn from this lesson because I ain't going to be here all the time. And there's going to be a point where you're the only way this demon comes out. That's good. That's why he's so frustrated. And then he deals with it. And then they come back and say, man, what's up? What do we do? And he lays it out. Mm -hmm. There are times when our fasted and prayered up lifestyle, either intentional in the moment or in general, is the only way we have that key and thus can bind that demon and loose what's necessary into that space left by the, by the eviction yeah. of the demon. Yeah, amen. Now, I am not pulling a bunch of different stories together. These are all in line in the same yeah. scriptures. Let me just tell you really quickly, saints, because I really want you to get this. Matthew 16 and 17, Mark 8 and 9, and Luke 9 all have versions of the same scripture. Yeah, amen. And let me tell you why we're saying it. No Limit Global. We are redeeming the loss, restoring those who have lost stuff. We are breaking through. This is a year of explosive grace. That's right. And I'm going to tell you right now, we need you to step into this. We are called not to just get people saved. Salvation is important. We're called to make disciples. Disciples. And discipleship in Jesus requires some things. We want you to, I want you to read this scripture. We need you to inspect yourselves. Understand Mm -hmm. what parts of you you're to deny. Uh, Pastor Chris and I talked. We're like, man, praise God we didn't meet when we were earlier in life. Yeah, praise the Lord. Because we'd have been a destructive force. That would not have been a divine appointment. That would not have been the divine appointment. Sometimes you could be cool, but that ain't the time to meet, right? You know, that's not the time for the appointment. There's an important, you know, lesson there too. Yeah. But we need you to step into this because those keys have your name on them. And those doors are to be supposed to be access to you, but you need to move into a position just like these disciples so that you can grab your keys so that when the assignment comes, you'll be ready. And Jesus won't look at you and say, what's up? Yeah. He, he clearly intended for them to have been able to deal with it. Every scripture, he says the same thing. What in the world are y'all doing? Why is this demon still in this kid? He had modeled it, he had taught it, but evidently they had not done enough to have those keys. That's right. The key that was necessary for that assignment. And saints, we're supposed to have those keys. We're supposed to have every key we have. There's never supposed to be an assignment that comes our way that we're not supposed to deal with. Now it happens, Mm -hmm. but it's not supposed to happen. All grace for all sufficiency for every good work. Amen. That's his plan. Amen. So there's nothing that you'll ever come up against that he hasn't equipped and given you everything you need to overcome. No limits means no limits. I know that was incredibly deep, but that means when we get something, we're supposed to be able to deal with it. That's right. That's right. Period. Now, that's what we're moving towards. That means, for example, when somebody comes with a prayer need, I mean, if we're around and you want some help, you can call us. But we fully expect you to be equipped to deal with the situation. Absolutely, That's what we want. The presence of God, the dunamis power of God that we don't talk about. We haven't talked about exousia yet, but the authority of God. God. Mm -hmm. All of that should be there for you because that's your assignment at that moment. And you're equipped and you should be able to manifest the power of God in your calling and in your life. And then the testimony can come back and we can share it. Absolutely. Right now, we'll be here for you if you need us. But our intention 
is for you, whether you walk out this building and it's in a sidewalk over here, whether you walk out this building and it's in a parking lot, whether it's in your house, whether it's in your neighborhood, whether it's in the work, grocery store, I don't care where it is. We intend for you to be empowered to deal with it. That's what disciples do. Amen. They do what the, what the one they discipled, got discipled from did. And that's that's right. why Jesus was frustrated. He was like, hey, man, what? Y'all have been with me. You are to do the thing that I can do. There's no reason for me to be able to do something that you can't. And that's what church is supposed to be. And there's a, it's a bit of a shock, right? I think yeah. it's like, Peter, you know I'm the Christ, but I need you to walk this out. That's right. I need you to, to pick up your mantle and carry yeah. it. Amen. And later he did. I mean, later, later people are diving in Peter's shadow That's to get right. healed. That's right. He got it. Right. But amen. Saints, I can't like, like, look, let me just say a quick prayer. And then I want you to lay on top of this. Holy Spirit, we want to walk in the full revelation of Jesus Christ. Please help us mm. with our walk in obedience, vulnerability, authenticity, and courage, denying ourselves, picking up our cross and following you as we aspire to each and every day become increasingly your disciples and more like you. Help us with our faith and rid us of any unbelief or fear. Lead us into a life of discipleship where true, explosive, dunamis, breakthrough, grace, and power flow through us. Enable us to be a revelation of you, Jesus, to all those who encounter us, our families, in work, any and every place we go. That is the call to activation, saints. That is a prayer for you. And now I just take it. Amen. Uh, knowing this, that his burden is easy and mm. his yoke is light. Mm. Oftentimes we take the words that we've just said about taking up your cross as a burden bearing thing, but his burden is easy and his yoke is light. That's right. And the reason it's light is because if you, once you've denied yourself, he, all he has given you mm. is the enabling power to achieve and do all that he's called you to do. But the denying yourself is the weight that you must release so that you can take the light burden. Mm. So Father, I thank you that we receive mm. the, the, the light yoke that you've given us and we release the heavy burden that we've been carrying, trying to perform to be what you called us to be as opposed to just walking in the grace that you've given us. So Father, we thank you that we walk in the freedom, in the power, in the glory that was bought by the blood of Jesus so that we can walk officially uh, with all the authority that you've given us as sons of the living God, mm. making mm. earth like heaven. Mm. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, everybody. Blessings to you. Have a wonderful week in Christ. And if you have any questions for us, just send them to us, email, text, uh, uh, Facebook in the chat. We'd love to uh, engage with you on it as necessary. Amen. And we've got small groups are happening right now. You mm -hmm. want to join a group. We've got the men's group, the women's group. We've also got uh, a group on business with a great business leader who's helping you, whether you're starting your business, you're already in business. She's going to cover a bunch of things. Um, so you want to be a part of one of those. Um, also, we've got the sneaker ball coming up. Uh, which is going to be great, man. Get you a fresh pair of uh, kicks, get dressed up. We're going to have a great time, man. It's going to be fantastic. And the last but not least, my spiritual parents, my mom and dad are coming uh, to do healing of the heart. And mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you, out of the heart uh, is where the living waters flow. And each one of us has sustained some trauma, some damage. There's weight that we're carrying. And mm -hmm. I'm telling you, this has changed my life and it will change your life. So you don't want to miss. You need to make space, make time. I'm asking you as pastor, this is a divine appointment for you to walk in freedom that you've probably never experienced before outside of seeing it around here. So you want to be at the Healing of the Heart Walk It Out weekend, which is February 17th and 18th. With that being said, watch this video and we will see you on Sunday. Hey family, I'm Pastor Chris, lead pastor here at No Limit Global in Richmond, Virginia. And I am honored, I am elated, I am excited to invite you to the Healing of the Heart Intensive right here in Richmond, Virginia, February 17th and 18th of 2023. And let me tell you, I'm not just excited because it's another conference. I'm excited because Pastor Lee and Denise helped to change my life, and I'm excited for the opportunity that you will have to have your life changed as well. Listen, my testimony is this. I met Pastor Lee and Denise a few years ago. My brother transitioned and went home to be with the Lord, and he wasn't just my brother. He was my brother. He was my mentor. He was my boss. 
He was my pastor. He was all of those things and I had built and associated my world around his world. So when he left this world, my world went to pieces. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know what I would do next. And I met Pastor Lee and Denise in that moment. And the Healing of the Heart Retreat helped me to free my heart, to free my mind, to free myself of judgments that I made, traumas that I had been through that were holding me back. Even in that moment that were holding me back and I was set free, healed and delivered. And what often takes years, if it ever happens, I was able to take care of in a weekend. And it gave me the foundational building blocks to walk in my true identity, who God called me to be. And I'm here to tell you that three years ago, I didn't know who I was or where I was going. But now, in less than three years, I'm sitting in a state-of-the-art facility. God has, has called me to pastor. People are benefiting. And I'm telling you, what I experienced in healing the heart not only restored my life, but it restored my wife. And the overflow of that restoration is, is flourishing in a congregation. It is changing lives simply because I took the step to get my heart healed. I'm inviting you to do the same. Many of us have experienced traumas and losses, and we've made judgments and have beliefs about beliefs about ourselves that we don't understand why we are, are, are trapped in this box or stuck in this glass ceiling or finding ourselves walking around in cycle. I'm here to cycles. I'm here to tell you it's likely because there are some traumas, there's some things in your past that you need to be healed from. And as a pastor, and, and as even as a, a church leader, I've seen pastors, we've, we attempt to teach it out. We, we attempt to do things to, to, to preach it out. But the fact of the matter is it takes a specific anointing to be healed from your past trauma. And so I just share with you on today, I invite you today, you want to be a part of the Healing Heart Intensive right here in Richmond, Virginia, led by Pastor Lee and Denise Balls. We'll be hosting it. I'll be here with you. But I want to invite you personally because it changed my life, and I am sure it will change you. We send all of our leaders there. And I've yet to have someone go and have the healing of the heart experience and not come back with a life change. So I am just overwhelmed with excitement that here in Richmond, Virginia, you will get to experience what I experienced for myself. What thousands of others have experienced in Hidden Night, North Carolina, now in Richmond, in February 17th and 18th, you will get the opportunity to experience it for yourself. God wants you to be healed. He wants you to be whole. He wants you to walk in your identity. And I will tell you, this will be the best investment you've ever made to getting to that place of being healed, whole, and walking in your identity. So I encourage you, sign up, register below for the Healing of the Heart Intensive here at No Limit Global in Richmond, Virginia, February 17th and 18th of 2023. I look forward to seeing you here. It will be the best investment you've ever made. That I will promise you. Bless you.